The Nature of Personal Reality by Jane Roberts Introduction by Jane Roberts Narrated by Kerry I'm proud to publish this book under my own name, though I don't fully understand the mechanics of its production or the nature I assume in delivering it. I had no conscious work to do on the book at all. I simply went into trance twice a week, spoke in a mediumistic capacity for Seth, or as Seth, and dictated the words to my husband, Robert Butts, who wrote them down. I consider the book mine in that I don't believe it could have been written without me and my particular abilities. On the other hand, I realised that far more is involved. I had to read the manuscript to find out what was in it, for example, and to that extent the book doesn't seem mine. But what does that mean? My idea briefly is this. Our usual orientation is focused pretty exclusively in what we think of as the real world. But there are many realities. By shifting our consciousness, we can glimpse these alternate realities and all of them are the appearance that reality takes under certain conditions. I don't believe that we can necessarily describe one in terms of the other. For years I've been confused trying to define Seth in the usual true and false world of facts. There he's accepted as an independent spirit, a spirit guide by those with spiritualistic beliefs, or as some displaced portion of my own personality by the scientific community. I couldn't accept either idea, at least not in undiluted form. If I said, look, people, I don't think that Seth is a spirit in the way you mean, then this was interpreted as an acknowledgement that Seth was only a portion of my personality. Some people thought that I was trying to put Seth down or deny them the aid of a super being when at last they thought they'd found one. Actually, I think that the selves we know in normal life are only the three-dimensional three dimensional actualizations of other source selves from which we receive our energy and life. Their reality can be contained in the framework of our creaturehood, though it is, though it is being constantly translated through our present individuality. The spirit guide designation may be a handy symbolic representation of this idea, and I'm not saying that spirit guides do not exist. I am saying that the idea deserves greater examination, for the spirit guide may represent something far different than we think. The idea can also be limiting if it always places revelatory knowledge outside of us and tries to make literal, sometimes extraordinary phenomena that may be beyond such, in, such interpretation. While I was trying to define Seth that way and questioning whether or not he was a spirit guide, I was closed off to some extent from his greater reality, which exists in terms of vast imaginative and creative power that is bigger than the world of facts and can't be contained in it. Seth's personality is quite observable in our sessions, for example, but the source of that personality isn't. For that matter, the origin of any personality is mysterious and not apparent in the objective world. My job is to enlarge the dimensions of that world and people's concepts of it. Seth's books may be the product of another dimensional aspect of my own consciousness, not focused in this reality, plus something else that is untranslatable into our terms, 
with Seth a great psychic creation more real than any fact. His existence may simply lie in a different order of events than the ones we were used to. I'm not saying that we should apply what we learn to the ordinary world. Certainly I'm trying to, to do that and Seth wrote this book to help people deal more effectively with their daily lives. I am insisting that we must be very careful about making literal interpretations lest we limit a multi-dimensional phenomenon by tying it down to a three-dimensional fact system. Intuitively and emotionally, we often understand more than we intellect intellectually realise. Trying to define revelatory knowledge or a Seth in terms of our limited ideas about human personality is like trying to translate, say, a rose to the number three or trying to explain one in terms of the other. The funny thing is that a personality not focused in our reality can help people live in that world most effectively and joyfully by showing them that other realities also exist. In this book, Seth is saying that you can change your experience by altering your beliefs about yourself and your physical existence. To me, the Seth material is no longer a continuing manuscript of fantas fascinating theories to be carefully judged against reality. In a strange way, it has come alive. The concepts within it live. I experienced them and because of this, my personal reality was expanded. I've begun to glimpse the greater inner dimensions from which our usual lives emerge and to familiarise myself with other alternate methods of perception that can be used not only to see other worlds but help us deal more effectively with this one. While Seth was producing this book, my own life was immeasurably enriched in unforeseen ways Frequent psychedelic type experiences paralleled Seth's dictated material and my own creative and psychic abilities developed into some entirely new areas. Just before Seth began The Nature of Personal Reality, a Seth book for instance, I found myself embarked on a new venture I call the Samurai Development. Samurai refers to a family of consciousness who share certain overall characteristics. There is a language involved that isn't a language in usual terms. I think that it operates as a psychological and psychic framework that frees us from normal verbal reference, letting me express and communicate inner feelings and data that lie just beneath formalized word patterns. The samurai development constantly expanded as Seth produced his book. Both now various altered states of consciousness are involved. In one I write samurai poetry and in the other I translate what I have written. At a different level I sing samurai songs, showing musical knowledge and accomplishment far beyond my normal talents or background. The songs could also be translated, but they communicate emotionally whether or not the words are understood. In yet another state of consciousness, material is received that is supposed to represent remnants of ancient speakers' manuscripts. These are also translated later. Seth defines the speakers as teachers both physical and non-physical, who constantly interpret and communicate inner knowledge through the ages. My husband has also written Samurai, but I have to translate it for him. As Seth continued dictating the nature of personal reality, I wrote a complete poetry manuscript, Dialogues of the Soul and Mortal Self in Time. 
in which I worked out many of my own beliefs as per suggestions Seth was giving me in this book. This led to another group of poems, the speakers. To me all this means that there is a rich vein of creativity and knowledge available to each according to his abilities just beneath the surface of us usual consciousness. I believe that is a part of our human heritage, accessible to some extent to any person who explores the inner dimensions of the mind. Dialogues of the soul and mortal self in time, the speakers, and some samurai poetry are being combined into a book that will publish soon by Prentice Hall. I consider it a companion book to this one. It shows what, has, what was happening in my personal reality while Seth was writing his book on the subject and reveals how the creative impetus splashes out into all areas of the personality. Seth often refers to the poems and to the experience that initiated them. Many of those events occurred as I tried to understand the relationship between his world and mine and the connection between the inner and outer experience. But besides this, as Seth was dictating this book, this present book, I also found myself suddenly writing a novel, The Education of Oversoul 7, which was produced more or less automatically. Oversoul 7, the main character, achieved his own kind of reality. I said mentally, OK 7, let's have the next chapter, and there it was as quickly as I could write it down. Portions of the book also came in the dream state. I know that Seven and his teacher, Cyprus, exist in certain terms, yet their reality can't be explained either in the usual fact world. Um, for example, the novel included many samurai poems and portions of speaker manuscripts. And when I sing samurai, I identify with Cyprus, who is supposed to be a fictional character. I could also tune in to Seven for help with those personal challenges I discovered. I love to go full blast ahead using my abilities as freely as possible. Yet quite as strongly I'm often scandalised intellectually by the same events that intuitively intrigue me or by the interpretation placed upon them. It does no good to pretend otherwise, and I think there's a good reason for this sometimes uneasy blend of intuition and intellect. I'm learning that both elements are important in my work and in cess. And perhaps my own refusal to accept pat answers leads me to search so intensely and is responsible to some degree for my bringing in a Seth instead of a Mad Hatter. The samurai development along with the experiences connected with the education of the of Oversoul 7 and the nature of personal reality books brought up so many questions that I was forced to seek a larger framework in which to understand what was happening. As a result I'm working on a book called Aspect Psychology which I hope will present a theory of personality large enough to contain man's psychic nature and activities. Seth refers to aspects, as we call it, in this present book, and it should be published sometime in 1975. In the meantime, all I can say is this. We live in a world of physical facts but these spring from a deeper reality of creativity. And in a real sense, facts are fictions that spring alive in our experience. All facts. Seth, then, is as much a fact as I am or you are. And in a strange way, he straddles both worlds. I hope that aspect will also span the world of facts and the, 
the rich inner realities from which they come from our ex for our experience includes each. The nature of personal reality book not only enriched my creative life but challenged my ideas and beliefs. I agree wholeheartedly with the concepts Seth presents here while realising that they run counter to many accepted religious, social and scientific dogmas. Certainly this book is an answer to all those who have written for help in applying Seth's ideas to ordinary living and I am certain that it will assist many people in dealing with the varied events and problems of daily life. Seth's main idea is that we create our personal reality through our conscious beliefs about ourself, others and the world. Following this is the concept that the point of power is the present, not in the past or this life or any other. He stresses the individual's capacity for conscious action and provide excellent exercises designed to show each person how to apply these theories to any life situation. The message is plain. We are not at the mercy of the subconscious or helpless before forces that we cannot understand. The conscious mind directs unconscious activity and has at its command all the powers of the inner self. These are activated according to our ideas of reality. We are gods couched in creaturehood, Seth says, given the ability to form our experience as our thoughts and our feelings become actualized. Seth first mentioned the nature of personal reality in session 608, April 5, 1972, only shortly after Rob and I finished re proof, reading proofs from his previous book. Seth speaks the eternal validity of the soul. He actually began dictation on April 10, 1972, but our personal reality was suddenly disturbed when we, caught, when we were caught in the flood caused by Tropical Storm Agnes. As a result, as you'll see in Rob's notes, further work on the book was delayed for some time. Seth often uses episodes from our lives as specific examples of larger issues and other experiences with the flood served as a starting point for his discussions of personal beliefs and disasters. In several other instances, he also used our life situation as his source material, an intriguing turnabout. Since the early days of our session, which began in late 1963, Seth has consistently called me Rupert and Rob Joseph, saying that these names refer to the greater selves from which our present identity spring. He continues that practice in this book. As usual, Rob methodically records each session in his own version of shorthand and then types it. This is much easier and faster than taping each session, replaying it and then typing it. Periodically, Rob notes the passage of time to show how long it takes Seth to get through a particular passage. Seth himself dictates the words to be underlined or put in quotes or parentheses. Often he indicates the placements of colons and other punctuation as well. This book should help each reader understand the nature of private experience and use that knowledge to make daily living more creative and enjoyable. Jane Roberts, Elmira, New York, November the 6th, 1973.